Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so here we have Dina Goldstein. And uh, Dina is, uh, is an amazing girl. I, uh, I knew her back at the university. Right, woman. I, I, so I knew her back at the university when we were both young and uh, so, yeah, and beautiful. Uh, well, I was never beautiful, but still. So, um, and back then in the university, Dina was already like a very known character and everybody knew Dina. And she was, she was the author of like the textbook that we used back in, in the university. It was like unbelievable. Uh, people actually, you know, gathered and bought her um, like a scanner with a multi-sheet feeder, whatever, which was like insane back then. Um, and she later started working at Bytesource and she did a lot of cool stuff in uh, Bytesource and she's going to tell us about one of those things. So uh, without further ado, here's Dina. Now I know you hear me. Is this better or worse? Better. Okay, no problem. Okay, so what are we going to talk uh, about today? So first of all, I'm going to tell you what dumps are, what they're good for, why we need them, what they can do for us. Um, then I'm going to talk to you about uh, analysis of these dump files, both manual analysis and automatic analysis. Then I'm going to present to you the entire flow of our automatic triage system for crashes. Okay, let's go on. First of all, I can't continue without talking about a bit about the background and you know self-promotion and everything. Uh, so BrightSource is an Israeli company. It's located in Jerusalem. We do solar energy, okay? Uh, here you can see an image. It's not very clear, but you can get the idea. Uh, from Google Earth, you can see three of our fields here. Um, I don't know any other company whose product you can see on Google Earth, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, what we do is that we build huge fields filled with mirrors, and they concentrate the energy of the sun to big boilers, which are located in the middle of the fields. And there's water inside, and it boils, and I'm not a physicist, but from what I understand, once we have steam, we have uh, electricity. So, <laughs> so that's that. And here you can see a close-up of, uh, of one of the fields. You can see the mirror here, and you can see the tower and the, boil, the boiler. And uh, the reason that it shines like that is that actually all the sunbeams are concentrated on the boiler, and that's why it looks like that. So why am I telling you all of this? Well, first of all, because we're cool and all that. <laughs> and second of all, because this entire operation, it's a bit, the pretty big one, it has control software and control software has bugs, <laughs> and the software crashes, and the developers have to fix it. And that's what we're here to talk about. So let's start with some bas basics. Um, what uh, users don't like violent crashes, okay? So, I mean, violent crashes, I mean that every, the program just shuts down and nothing happens and just disappears. So at first, what we did was wrap all the code up in a special mechanism which kind of swallowed all the unhandled exceptions and displayed a nice screen for the user. Uh, something along the lines of something, oops, something unexpected happened, please contact development, you can find log files here and there, something like that. And, and that was pretty good. I mean, our system is composed of several modules and they write a lot of logs, okay? It's pretty extensive. And we managed to solve quite a few bugs like that. We got reports from the field, something happened at this date, at this time. We opened the log files, we looked inside, we saw the, the error that was logged, and we managed to solve everything. But the problem was that as time passed, passed by, what happened is that we started encountering uh, crashes that happened, and we couldn't recreate them in the development environment. 
We couldn't understand from the logs what happened. We just couldn't. And so we had to tell the, the users, I'm sorry, we couldn't resolve this, is this issue. Please let us know again if this happens. Um, moreover, what was even more interesting is that sometimes we did manage to solve the problem, but the last error message in the log file was, had absolutely nothing to do with the actual problem. Okay, so that was a pretty common uh, scenario, and we had to, f to solve that. So what we really needed was a mechanism that allows us to know which exception happened, when it happened, and how exactly we got to that point of code with that exception. For example, let's say that my error was that some key was not found in some dictionary. Okay, that's not bad, it's good to know, but which key? Which dictionary? What was the flow of, the, of events that led me to this point in the code where I couldn't find that key in that dictionary? I can't know that from all the logs. The log is general. It could write, I mean, I could know that there was a problem with some key in some dictionary. But unless I treat each, uh, each exception specifically and write specific data, I can't know uh, more details, which I can see when I'm debugging the code itself. So I had, we had to find some sort of mechanism to allow us to get this data post-mortem, after the crash already happened. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, once again, this slide. Um, so luckily enough, this mechanism exists, okay? It's called a dump file. A dump file is essentially an image of the process's memory. Everything that belongs to this process exists in the dump file. It means that you can see there uh, all the threads that belong to the process, uh, all the data on the heap, all the local variables, all the call stacks for all the threads, um, all the locks, the threads that, take, that hold the locks, and the threads that wait on these locks. Really, anything that belongs to the process is saved in this dump file. So that's a pretty good place to start, okay? And luckily enough, uh, Windows can take uh, such dump file when a program crashes. And if the program crashes and we have this dump file, which which is a representation of the crash, of the memories, uh, of the process's memory at the moment of the crash, we can then look at it and see what's inside and try to analyze it. So we need a tool that does this. Luckily for us, again, this format is pretty standard and all the regular debuggers know how to open and read this data and, yes, I'm sorry, and read this data and so then we can take a look inside and see what's going on. Okay, so here you can see a screenshot of a dump file, which I opened with Visual Studio, sorry, uh, which I opened with Visual Studio, and do you see the fine print here? Okay, so it's not a lot of data, that's just a welcome screen for the, for the dump file, but what you can see here already, you can see the architecture of the, of the process, and two lines below that you can see uh, the actual exception that happened, and there was some sort of access violation. Some thread tried to read or write to a virtual address for which it does not have uh, an appropriate permissions or something like that. So something really wrong happened there. Okay, now let's look closely, more closely inside. I have here, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I have uh, Visual Studio here, and I already dragged uh, a dump file inside, okay? And that's the welcome screen. It's not the exact same dump file as in the slides, but it's similar. And here you can see the same, uh, the same data that you saw before. Um, now I can click on uh, debug, and I get a window saying that there was an exception, and some more data, even, from, what I, uh, from the exception, more than I saw in the welcome screen. And once I click on break here, I can actually see the call stack here. And I can look, sorry, and I can traverse the call stack, 
and see local variables from various points in the, in the call stack. And I can see exactly how I got to this point where I got the exception. I can also see other threads. Other threads. <laughs> Just a moment. Other threads, okay. And I can scroll down, there are plenty of threads here. I can click on this one, for example, and see the call stack for this thread, or, or this thread. And for each frame in, this, in these threads, in these call stacks, let's find something more interesting. Okay, and for each frame in the call stack of each of these threads, I can click on the, on the frame. If I have, if I have, uh, if I have source code available, I can provide it to the debugger, but I don't have source code available here, and even if I did, I wouldn't show you the code, so that doesn't matter, so I just cancel it. And now, if I had the code, I would actually see it here in this window, but I can see here in the locals tab all the local variables, and that's pretty cool, okay? All of this is data that I got from the dump file, because the dump file is an image of the process's memory. Sorry. Okay, how did this magic happen? How does the debugger, how does Visual, Visual Studio know all this stuff about my process, okay? I mean, I didn't compile this process now, I compiled it a while ago on a different machine, and somehow Visual Studio knows all this stuff. How is this, avail how is this possible? So the mechanism uh, is something called symbol fi uh, symbols, symbol file, or debug information. What happens is that any time we compile an executable or a DLL in Visual Studio, for example, also along with the DLL or executable, Visual Studio creates a file whose extension is PDB, and this file contains all sorts of uh, helper information which can help debuggers understand our code better. What does this uh, debug information contain? Mostly correspondence between uh, locations, uh, memory addresses, and method names. As we know, each method resigns in some location in the process's memory. So in order to understand and display this nice call stack, including DLL names and method names, there has to be a correspondence between the memory where the function resides and its name. Also, the debug information contains names of local variables, uh, arguments, their types, um, even, even file names and lines of code where the function was defined. That would allow, that's what allows me, when I open the source code in Visual Studio, to double click on a frame in a call stack, and Visual Studio would show me the code that corresponds to this frame. So that's also available using the symbols file. Now what happens if I don't have a symbols file? Here I show you the, what happens if I run the same debugger as I used for this, uh, for this dump. If I run the same debugger trying to get the call stack of the same dump file, okay, of the same thread, <laughs> everything the same, but I just didn't give the debugger the symbols file and see what happens. It doesn't even give me the correct call stack. It's not just that I have numbers instead of names. It's not just that I have numbers instead of names. I actually don't have the entire call stack. So symbols are essential uh, for me to be able to, de to debug and understand and analyze dump files correctly. By the way, um, a similar mechanism of uh, symbol files and, uh, and, and debug information and dumps uh, exists for Linux as well, uh, but it's a different format, so you can't use Visual Studio to debug, to debug a dump uh, of a Linux process. Um, I'm not familiar with the tools there, so we have to search online a bit, uh, but I know it, it exists. Okay, so,
So one thing I didn't say before is that each time we compile an executable or a DLL, a new symbol file gets created. Even if the code didn't change at all, still a new file is created, a new symbols file. And the debugger knows to make sure that we use the correct symbol files with the correct DLL. So if we try to debug an executable or a DLL with symbols file that were created during some different time, it just won't work. There are ways to force the debugger to load them anyway. I'll not get into this. But like the basic flow of events is that if you provide the debugger with a different uh, symbols file that was created during a different time, it just won't work. So it's essential, and since it's essential for us uh, to, s to have the symbols file available when we try to debug something, uh, we just need to save them. Every time we make a release of our product, we must save the symbols files that were created during the build process for our product. Um, sometimes people save it in the same folder as the release itself. Um, that's okay. Um, but we could make it a little bit better. Um, there's a concept called symbol server, um, where you can store your symbol files in a certain organized way. And the way you save them is that you, set, you organize them by the name of the executable or DLL and some hash code, which is unique and depends on the time that you compiled your executable or DLL. And why is that good for us? That's good for us because debuggers, the regular debuggers, use this standard mechanism of symbol server to retrieve symbols. So you can actually tell your debugger, hey, my symbol server is located in, and that's the symbol server, it's, it's a fancy word, it's not a server, it's just a folder on a shared network drive. And you can tell your debugger where your symbol server is. And once you've configured it, it will know for good where the symbols reside, and it will know how to retrieve them automatically without having to provide them manually each time you want to debug. And that's a really good thing, because usually you end up debugging many versions, many different versions of the same product. And you don't want to have to remember where the symbols reside, you just want you know, the debugger to work. So if, you have a, so if you have a certain place where all the developers store all their symbols in this specific format, okay, and everybody configure their debuggers to point to that symbol server, then everything just works magically. You don't have to think about it ever again. Now you're probably asking yourself, well, it looks like a real pain having to save the symbols in such an intricate format. How do you know the hash? I mean, it's quite long, and I certainly don't want to type it myself. Um, that's just you know error prone. And again, luckily for us, there's a tool distributed by Microsoft. It's called Sim Store. You just tell it where the symbol server is, and you tell it where your symbols file is, and it just stores the symbol file in the symbol server according to this format, okay? So you don't really have to do it yourself, you just use this tool to put your symbols in the symbol server and forget about it. I strongly recommend that you integrate this tool into your release procedure because then it would just get done automatically every time you do a release and you know, really don't have to think about it much. So it's really convenient. Okay. So that's why we've been talking about all sorts of general stuff. Uh, let's return to the bright source stuff and understand what are the challenges that we're facing and why analyzing the dumps in our situation was harder than in other situations. So let's talk a bit about our production, about our development and production environment. Our development environment is quite convenient. We have internet, we have network shares, we have mail, whatever. <laughs> we have link, and, and it's all good. But our product is power plants, okay? Power plants are not connected to the internet. They're not connected to anything, basically. There's an inner network, internal network, uh, shared between the between the servers, and we don't have, as programmers, as developers, we don't have access to it. 
if we need access to the production network, we need to go to a special room. It's in another room. There's a network there, which is located in Israel, and only this network can connect uh, through a special one-way, very secure, safe, whatever, all sorts of uh, security layers uh, in, in place there, and it can connect and do remote control over the computers in the production network, which are completely separate, again, from our development environment. And, and there's a possibility to copy files really, really, really slowly from the production network to the network in that specific room in our building, single room, okay? So that's, that makes things harder because if before we could for example, if we had uh, crashes in production, we could do remote debugging with Visual Studio or somehow connect and see what's going on live. We can't do that. The developers can't do anything live on the production, okay? And that's, that's a real problem. <laughs> As I said, we can't attach a debugger, we can't, do remote, uh, we can't do remote analysis. Moreover, as we saw before, symbols are very critical to our ability to analyze and understand uh, dump files and debug processes generally. Um, the problem with these uh, debug information files is that it makes hackers' lives easier. It actually makes reverse engineering easier. So, we can't, it's, it's very not usual to put uh, symbol files on production networks because production networks belong to our clients and we don't want to disclose our intellectual property to our clients. So the debug information, it just can't be anywhere near the production. It's in our office and our office is not connected <laughs> in any way to production. So. We can't even install Visual Studio or any debugger on the production network and like go there in this only room in the building <laughs> and do remote control and try to debug. We don't have that ability. The only thing that we can do is take dumps of our process, move them to Israel in intricate ways, and then analyze them post-mortem, okay? How do we take these dumps? So first of all, it's possible to take a dump of any process at any time uh, using, for example, Task Manager, okay? You can just right click on a process and mark take, a, take dump, yeah, I know it's funny. Uh, <laughs> um, and that creates a dump file, so that's possible, but that's manual and annoying and you know, you can't, you can't plan to take, a, to take the dump at the exact moment of the crash. So there's a mechanism in Windows which actually allows configuring Windows to take an automatic dump at the moment, at the exact moment of a crash. Uh, there's a link I put at the end of the slides. It's called uh, Windows Error Reporting. You just have to configure several stuff in the registry and then dumps are taken automatically and stored somewhere on the, on the disk. So, uh, so that's the only thing that we can do, actually. So we configured our, uh, our servers to get dumps of the processes that crash, and, uh, and once the shift was over, our operators can move them to uh, the office, uh, to the development environment, and when developers get there in the morning, they can have a look in the, in the network share or whatever, and, and see if there are new dumps that need to be analyzed. Let's go over the flow uh, of the manual analysis flow. Okay, so we need to take the uh, dump from the office share and get it to the developer's computer. Okay, obviously that's not really necessary. We could analyze the dump from the network share, but it's faster on an SSD, uh, on a machine with an SSD, rather than working on a network shared, which is, which is a slow storage which everybody access all the time. 
So, and dumps can, dumps can be pretty big. I mean, remember, it's an image of a process. So if we're talking 32-bit, it could be easily two, three gigs. Uh, if it's 64, you know, it can be much larger. So it's a large file, and we need to have it available somewhere. Then, if we don't have a symbol server in place, we need to find the version of the product that we're trying to, to debug. We need to find the symbol files. We need to give them to the debugger. We need to debug the dump file, locate the last exception that occurred, the one that, that caused the crush. Then we need to find the call stack that, that made us arrive at this exception. We need to locate the function in this call stack, uh, the first function that actually belongs to us, to bright source, and not, say, win32 or CLR or C runtime or whatever. We need to find something that's ours, that we can assign to some developer in bright source. We need to remember who that developer is. I mean, if I see some DLL, which I know it's ours, I need to remember who the developer that's assigned, that's you know, responsible of this DLL. And then I need to go to our project management uh, place and open a bug report. If, you know, if I don't like this developer very much, I would just write in the bug report that there's a dump for you, here's the location. Um, if, I'm, if I'm in a more cooperative mood, I probably should include a call stack, the exception, uh, maybe some other info that I found useful. And something else that I should mention here is that probably when we release a buggy version, a lot of the crashes are from the same location. So if I could also aggregate all the crashes that were caused by the same, by the same exception in the same location in the code, that would be really awesome. And well, aggregation is obviously impossible when you have dozens of, uh, of crashes per day, because it takes time. I wrote here, I guess that this whole process might take about 10 minutes for a dump, um, but from my own experience, after three of those, you start to get exponentially slower. Um, it's, really a, it's really an annoying task, <laughs> truly. It's, it's, it's repetitive, it's mundane, it's you just, you know, you have to, like a robot, you have to drag dumps inside, drag the, the symbols, click on debug, search for the call stack, find the developer responsible, open the ticket. It's really, it's not fun at all. And so aggregation is totally out of the question here. And, and you know, so, so we must find a way to do this better, really. Because with, you know, if it's about 10 minutes per dump, and I forgot to mention this before, but this whole thing was done during very uh, early stages of development of our project, and the software was, you know, really, it was un un unstable, let's call it that. And I think that in our worst days, we had dozens of crashes. So, you know, multiply dozens of crashes by 10 minutes. The developers don't get to do much developing. Um, so, so we should find a way to make it faster. Um, and we found this way. Um, a few years ago, Microsoft released a library uh, called CLRMD. It's distributed via Nug Nougat. Um, and what it gives us is that it gives us a programmatic API for debugging. It means I can do the same things that I described here before and I showed you like loading the dump, clicking play, looking at the threads, looking at the call stacks. It gives me a programmatic API and I can do all of that in code, meaning automatically, okay? So what it allows us to do, the exact things that we need. It allows us to get the last event in the code that happened in the, in the dump, uh, exception in our case. It allows us to get a list of all the threads that we have. It allows us to get the call stacks for each of these threads. It allows us to understand um, which thread had the exception that caused the crash. Um, it, allows us, uh, it allows us many more things, actually, but that's the things that we need for our process of analyzing the code. Uh, recently, this uh, library became open source. It's available on GitHub. 
Uh, I put a link here, but you can also Google uh, CLRMD, and it will probably get you to the right place. Let's look at some code. <laughs> Uh, those are snippets. You can't copy paste it exactly the way it is. Some uh, some uh, uh, local variable declaration is missing, but I just want to show you the concept. So the first line loads a dump. That was easy. Just one function loads a dump. Then what I want to show you here. Uh, oh, the mouse is not in the right place. Then what you can see here is how I get information about the last exception. Um, using uh, this library. So first of all, you can see here that I have, uh, that I have code that checks if this uh, process was managed or native. And that's a very uh, important feature. Although this library is written in C-sharp, it supports debugging and analyzing both native and managed code. That's very important because specifically in our case, and I assume that it might be similar in, in, very other, in many other cases, we had a UI, the, the, the system itself had a UI which was written in WPF, in .NET, but the core logic and algorithmic parts were written in C++, uh, which was wrapped in C++ CLI, and that's how the UI interacted with these modules. And so, most of the crashes actually were from the C++ code. Not because the C++ uh, developers were worse, but simply because most of the code was C++, and C++ is more complicated as it is. So, so most of the crashes were from C++, and it was very important for us to be able to get this dump from a managed process, which contained native parts, and be able to debug and analyze both parts of the process, okay? So here you can see that it's possible to, to understand if the process is managed or native. And well, it's not very important right now, but it is possible for a managed native to contain inside several versions of CLR. So the debugger even supports that. We could actually debug Oh, again, it's not right screen, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here you can see that it's possible to check if we have several versions of CLR in our process, and it's possible to debug all of them if we need. Um, so here I check what happens, I, I check if the process is managed, and if indeed the process is managed, I get more APIs available which expose more data. For example, I'll get to it uh, in a second in more detail, but here, if I know that the, that the process is managed, I can get more data about the current exception. I can get more data which is relevant for CLR, like the type of the exception, and not just a message describing uh, what was written inside. So now let's look how we get the exception information. Here we have uh, the get, get last event information method, that's a general method. It works both for managed and for native, uh, and it has quite a lot of out parameters. Um, I think that the important one for our, uh, for our purpose is the event type, because there are several events possible, and we're interested just in the events which are exceptions. Um, and the description, and the description. And, I'm sorry, and the thread index. This is, this, is, uh, this is the information that interests us because using the thread index, we can then go and ask for the call stack that belongs to this thread. And using the call stack, we'll be able to understand who's the developer responsible and who sh we should open the bug report on. Okay, so that's the general code. Here we get the uh, exception, whether it was native or, uh, or managed. And, uh, and here, we can see that if we know that the, that the process was managed, we can get even more data about, about the CLR exception. Alrighty, so last part <laughs> of this whole process is integration with the project manager. We use Redmine. Uh, <laughs> 
which is <laughs> one of the nice things about it, uh, besides being free and open source and all that, uh, is that it exposes a web API, which allows us to interact with it programmatically. And that's very important if we want to automate the entire process. Again, there's a wrapper available for this uh, web API. It's distributed via, via NuGet. Uh, actually, when I prepared these slides, I discovered there are now two wrappers uh, for this uh, web API. I'm not sure what the difference is. I guess I should check it sometime, but this whole thing was written a couple of years ago. Back then, there was only one, and it worked. So, you know, <laughs> if it works, don't change it. Awesome. Now the moment <laughs> we've all been waiting for. Uh, let's make an overview of our entire damp analysis uh, process, okay? That's, that's the holy grail we've been waiting for. At the end of each shift, we have, the, uh, we have operators coming uh, every day around, I think it was 3, 4 p.m. They were coming to the office in Israel, and the field was located in California. So they were coming in the afternoon, and working a night shift until five, six in the morning. And at the end of their shift, they would pack up all the dump files created and start move them, moving them to the office network. By the time the developers arrive to work, say eight, nine, 10 in the morning, they can go to our office, to our network share, see if there are new dumps and start analyzing them with our dump analyzer. Uh, which is automatic, as we said. According to a configuration file, which I'm going to show you in a bit, uh, the DAMP analyzer was also able to make a correspondence between the call stack and the developer, which you, we should open a ticket for. Here is a screenshot of the results, um, which I ran on this laptop a few days ago. Um, the, an uh, the analysis was on about 70 dump files, and it took like about three minutes, okay? So instead of having to go through 70, I think it was 74, 74 dump files uh, manually, opening each one of them, uh, running, the, running the code, the, running the commands in Visual Studio, which show us the call stacks and the threads and the exceptions and all that, I just clicked the button and it just worked, okay? Another thing you can see here, which is really nice, is the statistics at the end. Because all of this is automated and happens programmatically, it's really easy to make statistics on the dump file. So example, for, for example, we can see here a correspondence between the module name and the number of errors that happened. So we can know which module had the most bugs. We can know which developer had the least bugs. Um, and that's nice. We actually didn't implement uh, this ability in the dump analyzer, but obviously, now that we have this ability to make statistics on things, we can also do that, <laughs> do that aggregation I talked about before. Uh, and we can open a single ticket with many instances uh, of dump files which represent the same problem. So, to sum this up, I just want to show you that it works. Here is, oh, sorry again. Here is our configuration file. You can see here the location of the dumps. It's not very interesting. And then, that's the interesting part. Uh, we have the correspondence between uh, the modules and the developers which own this code, okay? So we have something called SFG, and Mush Hashor is responsible for that code. And we have SFC Optics, and it's Shalti Al Quak, okay? And the code is, <laughs> is able to go over the call stacks, understand which module is the first one in the call stack, and open a ticket for the, for the relevant developer. Let's run this. Okay. It's starting to run. It's displaying stuff on the screen, but let's look in my red mine. Okay, I see, let me make this bigger. I see tickets starting to appear. We had 18, I'll refresh. I have 28 now. 
So it's actually opening tickets right this moment. And let's look at them. Okay, it's a bug. There was a problem in the, in the title of the ticket. We can see the module and the name of the function. Sorry. The name of the function. And you can even see here the uh, exception that happened. If I click inside, I can see the call stack. Okay? So it actually works. <laughs> Sorry again. Okay. No, not okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. No, oh, damn it. Okay. That's the summary. So that's it. Um, I'll show you our entire flow. We talked about dumps, what they can give us, why they're good. Uh, I showed you the entire process, automatic process of our triage of crush dumps. I show you that it actually works. Uh, and there are some resources here if you want to try to do it at home. I do hope you don't have to analyze dozens of dumps per day. Thank you. <laughs>